Yesterday I suggested uh, that you do a homework exercise, draw the game tree for stop go, and do the rollback analysis. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to just run through the answer to that homework exercise. And on, along the way, we're going to talk about strategy, the concept of strategy, and the concept of a payoff, sort of deepen our understanding about those two ideas a little bit. Then we're going to go back and look at why this is uh, called a threat game, and then maybe what a trust game is. And if we've got time, we'll move into um, uh, starting to manipulate this little simple two-by-two -two game around by changing um, the order of a play, the kind of information that people have in the game. And next Monday, uh, we'll do another lecture on sequential games. We'll do a bargaining game. It's taking the basic idea, but elaborating a little bit, uh, adding more moves for players, a little more uh, discussion of the, of the payoff concept. And in the last couple of midterms, I've always had a question on this kind of bargaining kind of stuff. So you might want to look at the at some of the questions in the, in the last midterm as a, as a homework exercise. But that'll be for next Monday. And then on Tuesday, we started in chapter four, we got four lectures on what are called simultaneous games, okay? So uh, we're gonna stop sequential games, move on to sim simultaneous games. Now on the handout, uh, you should have something that looks like this, okay? And this is kind of like, if you were developing an answer for the question about the game tree uh, and analyzing that game tree for the stop-go game, you should eventually have something that looks like this. Yours might be a little different. Your analysis might be a little different, and that's okay. There isn't always one unique way to draw a, a, a game tree. But what I want to do is take some time to kind of go backwards and uh, un unpack this uh, game tree and the concepts uh, that are in it. Okay, So if you remember, Whoops, there is a little guy up here. If you remember, the, qu the question was, draw and label the game tree for lecture one stop go game. Okay, so basically, uh, you kind of go back, you look at what went on, try and figure out who are the players, what can they do, what's their information, what are their payoffs, okay? And I said on the payoff, just treat it as their own chocolate bars that are coming through, okay? And then, uh, after you draw the game tree, you want to analyze the game using rolling reasoning. And then the third question was count and list each player's strategies. Okay, so let's have a let's have a look here. The game tree. Okay, now if, remember um, with the game tree, we start off on the left hand side in a sequential game and move to the right hand side. That's an order of move, and the idea of the order of move is an order of observability. Okay, player A moves first, they can either stop, in which case the game stops, or they can say go, and then it move passes over to player B. But player B can look back and see what player A has done. So if B gets a chance to move, they know that red has played G. Okay, they've said go. B can stop or go. Uh, third round, if it's A's move, A can stop or go. Fourth round, it's B's move, they can stop, or go or stop. And in the fifth round, A can say stop or go, okay? Uh, just forget about this little extra G here for a second. Um, now, that's the structure of the game. And in a way, that captures the first three elements of the, of the PDIP. Who are the players? What can they do? And what's their information? And the information in this game is that... Um, but it, there's an order of play. The blue player gets to observe what the red player has done when they move second. And then when the red player moves third, they can look back and see what the blue player has done and also see what they've done. And then when the blue player moves again, they can look back this round, see that. They can see the whole history of, of play as we move out from left to right. Okay. Now, I've also put down these numbers, which we are thinking of as payoffs. Okay, and this is the division of the chocolate bars. If, the, if it's round one and A says stop, they get one, blue gets nothing. But if you pass it over to B, then pi goes up to size two, but B gets it all, B gets nothing. And if B passes it around to round three, A gets it all, and blue gets nothing. Pass it around to round four, B gets it all, four, red gets nothing, and then A, uh, at the last round, can either say stop, again, forget about that, little g there, and they'll get five, or they can say go, and they'll get five. Now, that's kind of a um, 
it doesn't matter what A does in the last round. Uh, so what we do is that I'm going to introduce what's called a reduced form. We can it doesn't matter what A says, so collapse it down to one move because they have the same payoff. Okay. Now sometimes that's a useful thing to do is like a person might have a bunch of different things they can do, but really they're indifferent between what they do because they all give them the same payoff, so they help simplify the tree a little bit. Okay. So these are, um, if you like, this is the complete information in the game. Now, the information in this game is available to the red player and to the blue player. So like when the red player is trying to think about what the blue player is going to do, the red player can look at the payoffs that the blue player has. Okay? When the blue player is trying to think about what the red player is going to do, the blue player can think of what the payoffs are that the red player has. Not just their own payoffs, but the other party's payoffs. Okay? So when we say a game of complete information, we don't just mean, you know, what do you know at the time uh, you're going to move, but also what do you know about the whole game in particular, what do you know about other people's playoffs? This is a, a game of complete information because everybody knows everything about the payoffs of not only themselves, but the other players. Now, that's a big assumption, okay? Remember, we had a, 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 it's a theory of games, and if the theory structure goes, well, if this, then that. We want to come up with a prediction at the end. But one of the big ifs is that in this game is that both players are completely aware of the structure of the game. In particular, each of them knows what the other person's playoffs are. Payoffs have to do with people's preferences. So that's like saying each of them knows what the other person's preferences are. That's a lot of familiarity, okay? In any kind of normal strategic situation, most often you're not sure uh, what the preferences are of other players. But, okay, so once we've got the game tree, then we can go and analyze it. Any questions about the game tree? Pretty straightforward? You know, what, one of the tasks that you have to do is, once you get the game tree, it's actually, now that we've got a method, it's pretty simple to analyze the game. But often, you, know, you might be given a video, you know, and you've got to watch this. Like, um, uh, one interesting thing in the discussion sessions you can do is, there's some really cool movies around, okay? And often there's some strategic interaction that goes on in these movies. And so you're watching a movie and you think, what's the structure of the game that's kind of going on there, okay? Uh, so you're kind of watching something visual, listening to something, and you think, okay, I'd like to analyze the game. Or there might be some text. Like when we introduced the little uh, chocolate bar game yesterday, I put some text up on the screen with a little table. There was no tree, but you could take that text and turn it into a game tree. So basically, one of the skills that you have to learn is how to look at something that's real and then take the game tree as your kind of model. And it's the PDIP structure. Who are the players? What can they do? What's their information? What's their payoffs? Okay? So uh, now that we've um, got the game tree, how do we analyze it? Well, one thing you want to try to avoid doing is starting at the beginning of some of these sequential games, especially if they get complicated, which we'll see in the bargaining games they do. Because the guy at the beginning is trying to think, okay, I know I can do certain things, but what's going to happen if I do these things? And if I do these things, then they will do some other things and they will be thinking about what I'm going to be doing out there, and so I've got to be thinking what I'm doing after what they're doing. It's like, ah, it's really complicated, all that thinking. So what we do is we go out to the end when there isn't any future. Okay? You go out to the end of the game. It's like when the game is over, at the, the last part of it, and you try and think, well, here, we boil it down. A can do anything, and they're going to get five chocolate bars if they get there. Okay? So um, let's look at it from B's perspective. Okay? If B... Moving backwards from the end, I mean, everybody knows the game. A knows the game, B knows the game. So if we get out to the end, then what will B do? Now, B can think this and A can think this at the same time because they know all parts of the game. And, well, if B goes go, he's getting zero. If B goes stop, he's getting four. Four is better than zero. And, again, if we're, these are their payoffs, so B is going to say stop and we can prune this branch here of the game tree. Now remember this idea of pruning, this is a, a way of thinking about strategic interaction a lot is, okay, I'm not sure what a player is going to do, but I might find things that they won't do. Okay? I can eliminate some actions for them. And that's a, it's a useful thing. Sometimes you're not sure what people will do when you're interacting with them, but you're pretty sure about what they won't do. Here we're very sure that they won't play Go, given we know their payoffs. Okay, so they do stop. So then now 
we're working backwards, and we figured, well, the last two rounds we've actually figured out. We don't even have to. We're not going to get to the fifth round. We're just going to stop at the fourth round if we get there. It's not going to go anywhere. I mean, in the game, it could possibly go there. And it's a possibility, but we don't expect it to. Who's we? Me, the analyst. You, the analyst. B, the player. A, the player, because they're rational, intelligent players. They can see all this stuff. There's no time pressure. They can think it through. Okay. Um, let's go to round three. A can either go or stop. If they go, they get nothing because B is taking everything in the next round. And if they stop, A gets three. Three is better than nothing, or it's a higher number. Okay. Uh, we're going to look at this payoff number in a second, but we're looking for the higher numbers when we're comparing things. So again, we can prune the second branch. Now again, this pruning operation is in our heads. Everybody's trying to figure out what to expect in this game. Uh, it's a possible thing for A to, to uh, play go, but it's not a rational thing in light of their preferences. You know, if they're trying to play the game in light of their own preferences, then they should stop rather than go. Why? Because they expect B to stop rather than go later on, even though if B didn't, they could get five. This would be really cool. Don't always expect cool things, okay? Because to get to the cool things, five, you have to rely on somebody else to do something for you. And here, you don't expect them to do it. So now we keep moving backwards. We're moving now. Remember, we're starting the right. Now we're moving backwards. Uh, round two, B is looking forward. Plays go. You can expect to get zero because he expects all this other stuff. He doesn't expect to get out here four, even though again four would be so cool if they just would do it. You know, one more round and I could get all this stuff. You know, this is the way the casino works. It's like one more roll of those dice. You know. Well, okay. So it doesn't work this way here. We can look forward and get zero, or we can get two. Two is better than zero, so we're going to prune the G branch. And we keep working backwards, and we prune this branch. You can see we're moving from right to left here. That's going from the end back to the beginning. That's called rollback from our text. Okay, you're rolling back, just kind of, or folding back from one node to another. Uh, the textbook uses this terminology, rollback. If you use any other textbooks, they'll often talk about what's called backward induction. But it's the same logic. It's kind of... You know, the simplest thing is look before you leap. Okay. You, you, before you do something, you're going to look ahead and anticipate. Okay. Well, now we go out and, okay, we've anticipated. We're sitting out here, standing at the edge of the cliff. We're anticipating, we're anticipating, we're anticipating, we're anticipating, and just going backwards. Okay. So that's called rollback reasoning. And then what we do is we write down what we call the full answer. I mean, this is, a, this is an answer. Remember, it was built up by all these assumptions that people can anticipate into the future. They can identify their courses of action of themselves or other players. They can identify the preferences of themselves and the other players at all these future opportunities. They can work all this stuff out. And what we find is what we call the rollback equilibrium. Okay? Often we'll just use the term equilibrium with the idea that's our prediction. Okay? It's not an equilibrium in an engineering sense. It, you'll see, we'll, we'll, there's, there is a rationale for thinking it as a balance in some sense, but it's, it's a balance of strategies. Okay? It's not a balance of weights or forces or powers at this stage. Okay? And so we call it, a, here's the equilibrium path of play is, hmm, that's what we should observe. A stopping in the first round, grabbing that first chocolate bar. That's what the theory predicts. But you saw from what we did, from our answers, that people did all kinds of stuff. Okay? Sometimes the theory's wrong. Okay? And you want to ask, well, uh, why is the theory wrong? Good question. But at, at the moment, this is what the theory is. Okay? So uh, the equilibrium path of play is just uh, for A to stop in the first round and the game stops. Okay? The equilibrium outcomes or the payoffs are circled here. This is what people get out of this game. Okay? There's, one, there's some behavior. They get some payoffs. And that's what we predict will actually happen. There's all kinds of things which could have happened which didn't happen. They're sitting out here in the rest of the game tree. Okay? And they're interesting to look at. Oh, man, you know, one lousy chocolate bar, whereas if we've been able to carry it out, which the pair did over here, because Fountain went out of the room, and I said change rules so you could talk to another, 
and make an agreement and then split the chocolate bars up in different ways. So that's a different game, right? It's got different same players, but they can do different things. They can send messages back and forth. They can, they can make contracts and agreements. They can, uh, they can divide up the pie in different ways than in this game. Uh, their information uh, is different. The information structure is similar, but they've got this pre-play communication stage, which really helps, okay? And then after the play, when they get out, and say that one of the guys picks up the five chocolate bars and he tries to run away, and the other guy can chase him down and catch him, you know, and split the chocolate bars. Uh, they got some way of enforcing what their, their, their agreement is. Okay, that's a different game. Why is it a different game? Because it's got a different PDIP structure. Now, there's another concept here called a strategy. Okay, a strategy, okay, a strategy, there's a, a simple little thing you should memorize. A strategy is a complete specification of what a player will do in all the situations they find themselves in a game. Okay? So it's, it's a plan of action, but it's a complete plan of action. Okay? What we're saying is that if A says stop, the game's over, he takes his one chocolate bar, go home. Okay? That's a move, if you like, or a course of action, but it's not a strategy. Because the strategy says for A, he says, what would they do in all the circumstances they find themselves in? And the equilibrium strategy here, as we worked it out, was to play stop here, to play stop there, and to play stop there. Stop or go will do, okay, at the end. It doesn't really matter. Now, from the tree, you can identify the strategies, but sometimes you want to write them down, and we're going to write them down as a list. Okay, so SSS with commas there, or SSG is the list of strategies. Got that? Um, now, the list is important because there's a meaning to this first space. The first space here corresponds to what they would do at that situation, that node. The second space is what corresponds to what they would do at the second situation they get themselves into the game. And the, this space here corresponds to the third situation they get themselves into the game. Okay? Now, it's important to think about this idea of a situation in a game tree. Here, the situation is, I just got to make a decision. What's going to... Some of the more complicated games we we're going to look at later on is when you're sitting out here in the future, your player A, you're looking at the back and you, you can't see everything that went on in the past. You're not sure what situation you're in. Okay? We're going to call that an information set, but that's going to be a situation where you have a course of action that you can do. Good. Okay, and similarly, B's equilibrium strategy, the strategies are what they would do in the circumstances they find themselves in. Well, B finds themselves here and here, so we need a, a two-element list, and that is... S yes, and S. Yes. Okay, so that's the idea of a uh, of a strategy. Now I did ask you to count all the possible strategies, and I put these down here: all the possible strategies for blue and all the possible strategies for red. Okay. Now, how do I get the blue ones? They're a little bit easier because what we're saying is that. Imagine filling the first slot with G's. Well, the first slot is what the blue player could do here. So they're going to go. So that's a G and a G. And then in the second slot, which is up at this node here, they can either go or stop. So there's two of the strategies. And the other two are, well, flip it around. What could they do at the first node? S and S. They can stop. And then at the second node, they can either go or stop. Okay, so there's four strategies, even though player B only has, like, intuitively two moves. They can either stop or go, but they can do those two things in two different places, so there's two times two equals four. I didn't... S now, it turns out that two plus two is equal to four, but it's always two times two. If you get confused, multiply, don't add when you're counting strategies. And to see that, let's look at the situation from the red player's standpoint. Okay? Red player... Uh, the red player uh, can make a a move or a course of action at three points here, here, and here. So let's fill in the first point first with, and imagine they do goes. So that's what I've done. That's what I've done here. I've got a um, a go and a go, and a st here's a go and a go here. Okay, and there's a stop and a stop, and a stop and a stop here. Now I've got eight of these guys. You have to want how did Fountain know to get eight? Well. It turns out that there's two things they can do here, times two they can do there, times two there. So there's a list's got to be, there's got to be eight elements in, uh, in, this, in this set of strategies. Sorry, there's eight strategies. Two times two times two, two to the third is eight. Okay. Now, notice that if you were kind of um, uh, 
thinking about adding up what their moves, you go one, two, three, four, five. Okay? So you've got like five strategies. And then you might add in this one here six, because they could go at the end. So two plus two plus two is six. Okay? But you don't add, you multiply. And the reason is we want to find all the logically possible strategies. Okay? And so there are two ways they could, we can fill up that first space. So one, and so we've got these filled up all with G's and S's. And then for each of those, we've got a, two ways we can fill up the second one. So if we put two G's in here, we can have a G or an S. Okay? Once we filled in these two slots, we can fill in the third one with an S and a G. So that's basically how you write the list out. You can imagine, as the game gets more complicated and you've got more moves, writing out the list would be a terrible thing to do. Okay? Now, I mention this because um, when we get to the bargaining game, you know, we'll, you might, we'll be in a bargaining situation and there'll be offers and counteroffers, and you might want to sell something for $10 or $9 or $8 or $7 or $6, and you try and draw the game tree for that, and then someone else's counteroffers and their counteroffers, and it, it's going to be all over the place. You try and, you try and analyze, this, list the strategies, it could be really difficult because you've got to write out all these things out and get, count them all up. If you're at stats, when you do these combinatoric formulas, that helps, but we don't want to do stats. I just want you to get this idea that the, when you're thinking of strategies, there's all kinds of possible strategies. Okay? There's only one, well, there's one equilibrium strategy for the blue player, S and S, and there's two possible equilibrium strategies for the A player, the three S's or the three S's and G's. Okay? Those, are the, those are what we predict would be the strategies, which would be the reasoning, the beliefs behind what player and A are doing. Now, notice I said the strategies, but I also said the beliefs, because these strategies are based on beliefs about what's going to happen at these various nodes that might occur in the game that never actually occurred. But they do, thinking through that, expecting what's going to happen there is what helps us figure out what the solution of the game is. Okay. So, uh, I didn't give you the handout of this. You, you don't have to just copy this down, but uh, you can get it up on the web afterward. The strategy concept is a fundamental idea. It's deeper than just observing what people do, because it's also a specification of what they would do in situations where they find themselves in the game, any situation. Okay. So these are a whole bunch of different possibilities. And equilibrium strategies are going to be what people believe would happen in all these other circumstances in the game if the game continued on, because those beliefs are going to affect what their actual strategies are in the game, and then what we predict will eventually happen. We sometimes use a list notation for strategies, and there's kind of an idea. It's called the virtual mom test. And the virtual mom is to, like you've got to, you've got to, you can give it to your lawyer if you trusted them, but you might trust your mom more. Um, you know, if players are playing and we know their strategies, we should be able to fit all those strategies together and come up with a prediction from the play. Okay, once we have the strategies, because the strategy tells what you would do in all the circumstances you find yourself in. You know, so if each player, we have a, a list of their strategies, we should be able to work out from that list what the uh, prediction of the, of the outcome of the game would be. The strategies are often redundant in the sense that in the game, like when we go back over here, Again, if you're writing this down, just hang on a second. In the game, we didn't get to these points in the game, but the strategy said what would happen in those points in the game. Okay, so that's what I mean by redundant. We never got there. You know, uh, all you really needed to do was for the A players to say stop. Okay, but to think through the game from both players' standpoint, you need to be able to identify their strategies. So, that's, so there's a completeness aspect to strategies. That's it's it's deeper than just a plan of action because it's a complete plan of action. That's its strength, but it's also its weakness, because most of us, you know, it's like, how do you think through a complete plan of action in a complicated game? Okay. Let me... Um, uh, get rid of... Well, okay. Look at this little graph. Okay, looks like a little centipede, right? You know, those insects with a little 
segments that are, look like discs and two little legs popping down. So it's called a centipede game. And the centipede game is analyzed in your text in chapter 3 on page 71. And you can see the basic structure to a centipede game. It's a binary choices at each of the nodes. And here there's kind of a growing pie. Okay? Well, sometimes you can have a centipede game that starts off high with a shrinking pie. Okay? Um, but the idea of these centipede games is the, the experimental economists have looked at them uh, kind of in depth and tried to figure out how people play. And Martin Osborne in his text has come up with an interesting centipede game. Okay, this, this is the nature, this is the structure game. Again, don't scratch this down. I'll put this up in the web after on the handout so you can print it off. And I put a, there's two pages in, in Morton's text where he explains, it tries to figure out what's, what's going on here, you know? And this, here's a centipede game. Uh, we've got 58 students, each of them playing the game nine times. It's, they keep it really anonymous so you don't have to worry about, uh, uh, you know, getting put down by other players because they know what your payoffs are afterwards. And the nature of the game is you start off with 50 cents, but it's split towards red. Then you go to a buck, and it's split toward blue. Then you double it again, and it's split toward red. And you double it again, you double it again, you double it again. You know, you're going up. Okay? So it's, it's a growing pie. Um, nice big payoffs there at the end. Uh, and these are the observed rounds in which the game actually stopped. Okay? So this is like a frequency distribution. And the theory predicts everybody should have stopped in the first round. Everybody figured out the game. Okay? But the theory was wrong because most of the time, people are doing something else. They're going farther out in the game, trying to get a little bit out here towards these higher payoffs. Okay? Some people have got all the way out to the end small fraction, but about the same fraction as the theory predicted would stop at the beginning. Okay? And uh, the, um, there's a lot of these middle outcomes. Now, so you might ask yourself, why? Why does this occur? Isn't this a contradiction of the theory? Well, definitely a contradiction of the theory. Okay? And there was uh, one in the, I think it was the second class, we had some questions after, and one of the students came up and said, well, uh, gee, you know, when, if there's any chance at all that a guy's going to go on, aren't you... You know, I mean, in theory, if you know what his payoffs are, fine. But if you don't, then wouldn't you want to play anyhow? Just take, see if you can get those big payoffs. And that's basically the argument that, that they use to justify this, is people, people who could predict that other people would behave like this, they were quite justified rationally in going on a little bit in the game instead of stopping here, because it was more likely that they would get a good payoff. But now, the thing is that you don't know what other players are going to do, so we have to go back and think about what your payoffs are going to be in those kind of situations where you're uncertain about what the payoffs are of the other players. Yes, your keys are right here. Okay. Okay. So, um, again, that's a different game. It's a different game where, where you're uncertain about what the other players are doing, and then if you, if you look at your uncertainty and take account of that in the game, then it turns out that predictions of games there aren't so bad. Okay. It's just that in the beginning here, with this game of what we call complete and perfect information, it doesn't look like it works very well. Now, um, one other thing I want to look at is the, uh, this idea of, of payoffs and outcomes. I've been talking about them as if they're the same. Okay? And, but if you remember the first little game tree, that I, the two-by-two two one I drew, I put in little black boxes before I put the... Uh, uh, the payoff numbers down. And the idea of the black box was there's some sort of outcome of some interaction. By outcome, we mean something measurable. So for example, in our games, it was the chocolate bars that each of you got, okay, or the coins, or the money. And it's, you know, everybody can see what those outcomes are, but it's more difficult to see what people's preferences are. Now, it could be that your payoffs are your outcomes. Okay? Remember, with preferences, we're trying to think, how do people rank the various things that could happen in this game? So how does player A rank getting one chocolate bar, or getting no chocolate bars, or getting three chocolate bars, or getting no chocolate bars, or getting five chocolate bars? Or actually, how do they rank getting one and the blue guy getting none? How do they rank themselves getting none and the blue guy getting two? Okay, now, Often you can, you can sort of think, well, you know, I'm just interested in my one chocolate bar. I don't care about the other person. But supposing they're your friend. They're part of your family. They're part of a club. They're part of a class. And you think, okay, I'm comparing one for me and none for them versus nothing for me and two for them. You might think, okay, 
what's one? You know, I lose one if I move from here to here. The other guy gets two. That's better for me. Okay. So the preference ranking doesn't necessarily have to be the same as the, uh, the, the numbers that occur in the outcomes. So I've put in a few little possibilities for you here. The, the first thing is that the payoffs, the payoffs you could represent just by the numbers in the outcomes. Why is that a, an issue? Well, remember, the payoffs are supposed to be preference ranks. Preference ranks are supposed to be things where higher numbers represent higher more preferred options. Well, if we're just looking at it from the standpoint, if A is looking at it from the standpoint of uh, his or her chocolate bars, then the highest number out here is a, uh, a 5, so we can put that as a preference rank. The lowest number is a 0, we can put that as a preference rank here and here. We can put that number as a preference rank, and oh, lo and behold, these numbers, 5 is higher than 3, is higher than one, is higher than zero, that reflects their preference ranks. Okay? They like this one the best, this is the second best, this is the third best, and they're indifferent between those last two because they get nothing if they're just looking at their component of the outcome. Okay? So the outcome numbers and the payoff preference rank numbers can be the same. However, we, what we've been doing is we've been putting preference ranks um, in terms of... Um, you know, four, three, two, one, you know, we're sort of saying, well, higher numbers, higher rank, so we want the rank. And if there's four items, which there are, for the red player, it's like there's five, poss uh, five possibilities here, but there are only four real outcomes because we're either going to get a five, a zero, a three, a one, or a zero. Okay, so there's only four outcomes. If we want to rank those outcomes, the best is, f is getting five chocolate bars or five coins. That's the highest rank, which is four. The worst is getting nothing, which is lowest rank, which is one. Lowest rank, which is one. And then uh, second from the bottom, third from the bottom, or second from the top. Okay? Now, with rankings, you see the, the idea is something, oh, this is my first rank, so you might think I'm going to put the number one. We're not going to play that game or that interpretation. We're going to be the other way around. Higher numbers, more preferred. Okay? So the second rank is a little bit lower, it's going to have a lower number than the first rank, but it's going to be above everything else. What about numbers like these? 16, minus 1, 25, minus 1, 30. Thinking, where do you get those? Anywhere. Absolutely anywhere. When you think of preference ranks, all you care about is that one number is higher than the other number to give an order of preference. So the, here's the best outcome from the red player, if they're self-interested. Uh, five. Well, it, so we want it to have the highest number, which it does. 30 is higher than 25, is higher than 16, is higher than minus 1. Okay. What about the worst outcome? The worst outcome is 0 here or here. It's got a number of minus 1. Well, that's the lowest number out of 16, minus 1, 25, minus 1, and 30. So it's like, okay, that's legitimate, best and worst. And you'll see the similar uh, case for the, uh, the second highest, most preferred. The number 25 is just as good, I mean, sir is lower than 30, is above 16, just like 3 is lower than 4, is above 2. Okay? Now, the reason I'm trying to emphasize this is with numbers, it's really tempting just to subtract them, right? So you sort of think, oh, here's my, here's my best option, 4. Here's my worst option, 1. Surely I'm 4 times better than I am here, because I can multiply that. Or I'm, I'm 3 rankings above it, okay? Or we look at these numbers. Here I got five chocolate bars, and here I have one. I'm five times better. Or I got four more. You have four more chocolate bars, no doubt about it. Okay, that's counting. But what's how much more preference do you have? You know, it's like uh, five chocolate bars, one chocolate bar, not much in it. Okay, so it's deceptive the equal spacing that comes from the usual ranking of four, three, two, and one. Okay, that's. It, I mean, it's there. People want to take account of it. Uh, and say, okay, well, I can use these differences because they're numbers, but for preference rankings, it doesn't matter. You know, in instead of saying that you're three units better here than there, you could equally say, well, I'm 31 units better here than there because the difference doesn't make any sense for a preference rank, okay? Just to drive that home, let me get rid of this. Supposing I use letter grades for preference ranks, okay? We, we, you know, we often think it's A, good grade, B, not so good, 
C, okay, D, getting kind of low, E, you know, in the, in the academic scale, letter grades go from left is, is good and down to the right is not so good, you know. So far, we haven't anything less than Fs. You know, I don't know what GHs and Is and Js would be on your transcript, but presumably they wouldn't be very good. Um, so, but that's all we need. So if I put letters in here, you should be able to analyze that game. Again, that's another homework exercise that you could uh, try out is change the preferences around in one of these more complicated games or, or in the two-by-two two game, change the preferences to letter grades, analyze the game to see, oh yeah, all I need is the order. A is better than B, B is better than C, and C is better than D, and there's two Ds, so they're indifferent. Okay? So I, I just need the order. I don't need the, the numbers. Now, if I was to put both letter grades in here, then it would uh, you think, oh, okay, I could still analyze that game because I, I have information on their preference ranking. As long as it, those lower, you know, lower letters or letters earlier in the English alphabet are more preferred, then I can figure out what the preferences are and I can go through and analyze the game. Got that idea? So this is the, these preferences or payoffs are what we call ordinal numbers. Ordinal for number, uh, for order. Okay. All that matters is a relative comparison, not that the absolute size of the difference is basically meaningless, even though you look at the numbers and you can do whatever you like. Now, in terms of outcomes, it's not meaningless. Okay. If this is $5 and that's $1, you know, you've got, it's $4 more. And nobody's denying that. It's just that, okay, you know, economists sometimes think this way is, okay, well, you know, the first thousand bucks that I make in a month is like, wow, you know, it pays my rent, it gets my car going, it gets my food, it's really worth a lot. Second thousand, you know, it's more entertainment, skiing, stuff like that. And the third thousand, well, I got to put it in a bank and it's way out there in the future or something like that. It's like what we call diminishing marginal preference. It's like the money is, more money is better than less, but those, the first bit of money you have is kind of relatively more important than later money, okay? Now, um, That's the idea of, of preferences. I want to introduce um, two more ideas. So far, when I've looked at this preference, and I've talked about letter grades, and I've talked about numbers, I've been, I've been assuming that people are looking at the outcomes just from their own components. The red guy is only looking at their component. The blue guy is only looking at their component. Now, what you sort of think of is like in the class, if we're all playing a game, if it's against one another, it may be with one another, is like, um, let's say your grade at the end matters. Okay? matters to you. And it might matter, you know, you might have neighbors that you know something about. We've got 100 people here, we'd have a list of outcomes at the end of what all those grades are. If, if it's a game of complete information, you would know what those are and you'd sort of think, well, do I have any preferences about those? Am I worried about other people in the class? Okay. And you might well be. I mean, they might be your friend. Uh, you might generally like it if other students got good grades or you might actually think, oh, I, I want my A, but I want them all to have C's or D's because that shows me that Everybody else, I'm really good. Okay, uh, the you could have preferences over the outcomes for other people. We met one of these guys in our um, uh, in our class. I can't remember his name, but it was like I was playing the game just to keep the game going. Okay? I don't want to stop in the first round. I want to I want this thing to keep going right to the end. So the end has let's take it. Say it's a blue player that's like this. The end is, is their best. A is better. Go, going out five rounds is better than four rounds, is better than three rounds, is better than two rounds, is better than one round. Okay. So if their preferences are like this, it's a different game. PDIP, who are the players, what can they do, what their information, what their payoffs are, this is a different game. And you'd predict different outcomes. If you were a, um, you'd expect this guy to be going all the time, um, if you do the back... Do, sorry. Not what you'd expect. You can do the rollback reasoning on this, and you would find from that that the equilibrium pattern of play is different than what we predicted. Matter of fact, that's a good homework exercise. Do it. That'd be a good question for the exam. Okay. Here's a here's a player. One of the players is self-interested. The red player, the blue player, just wants to keep the game going. What do you predict will happen in that game? Use rollback reasoning to predict what will happen in that game. There's another pattern of, that you could think about, 
and we call this an altruist, someone who cares about the distribution of the total. So if you look at these outcomes, you can sort of think of them as, it's a pie. It's getting bigger, it's getting bigger, it's getting bigger. If we just delay until we get out here at the end, it, it's a big pie. But it's unevenly distributed, right? It's either all or none for these two people. Well, supposing you're an, an altruist, and all you do is you care about uh, the, the blue player, uh, cares about the uh, red player getting big payoffs. Okay? So the best thing for the blue player is sitting out here where they get nothing, the other guy gets everything. Okay? This is, I want to give away everything. You know? And now why would you want to do that? Well, it might be that you know, you've got lots of money, you've got lots of wealth, you don't really care. You think, I want them to have all the chocolate bars. That's my best outcome. My second best is where I don't have anything, and again, they have everything. And my third best is where, okay, it's a small pie, but they've got it all. I've got nothing. I actually don't want anything. I want them to have the stuff. And situations where I have something and they have nothing, I don't like. Okay? So that's another pattern of preferences. And again, when you think about it, it's, it's quite reasonable for, I mean, it's, it's not irrational to have these preferences. It's not self-interested, but it's certainly not irrational. You can take account of um, uh, other people's preferences, sorry, other people's outcomes uh, in a game. You can have preferences for them, and you can analyze the game using rollback using the altruist. Again, try that. Okay? Use the rollback reasoning. Try and predict what would be the outcome of the game if you have a, um, uh, an altruist, the blue player, playing against a self-interested person, the red player. And then you might think, oh, what about two altru altruists? Okay, I'm looking out for you, you're looking out for me, but actually you're looking out for me as if I was self-interested, and I'm looking out for you as you're self-interested, but really you're not self-interested, you're altruistic. Okay? So you have two altruists playing against one another as well. Homework exercise, practice that. So that's the idea of payoffs. The um, thing about payoffs is every game we play, all the little ones, we're going we're gonna to always have numbers up there because numbers are going to be our way of representing payoffs. And the first thing that should occur in your head when you see a little payoff table or a game tree with numbers in it is, how do, what, what do these payoff numbers mean? How do, how do we measure these, these things? Is it just a preference rank or is it chocolate bars? Is it money? That, are people caring about themselves or others uh, in this kind of game? Um, and we can have you know, self-interested or self-regarding preferences, other regarding preferences. Um, just to have that idea there, when we get to uncertainty where you're thinking um, again in the stop-go game and I think, I don't know whether this guy's going to be an altruist, I don't know whether he wants to keep the game going, I don't know if he's self-interested. It's like, how do I calculate, figure out what my payoffs are going to be when I don't know what's going to happen? Again, we'll spend a good couple of lectures trying to think through how to think about and measure payoffs in those circumstances. Now, um, I want to go back to the basic sequential two-by-two two game and uh, see why it's called a threat game. Okay? The, um, the basic idea here, we, as when we analyze this game, is we, we have the red player decides to invest, the blue player doesn't enter, and they both get these intermediate payoffs. Now, from the blue player's standpoint, they would have liked it, because four is higher than three, they would have liked it if the red player had not invested and they could have entered. Okay? So you might think, well, what, if, what about making a threat? Okay? What if I'm, the, if I'm the blue player and I threaten the red player, say, look it, <clears throat> if you invest, I'm going to enter, I'm going to fight. Okay? Now, if, if you could make the red player believe that, then the red player would be believing they'd get a one if the game got up here. They'd come down here um, they think you're going to enter, so they're going to get it. They could get a two, so they wouldn't invest, and you would enter, and you'd get four. Okay, so you got that idea. It's there's a potential for a threat here. Okay, and the problem with this game is that the threat isn't believable, and the reason it isn't believable is that, or at least the red player shouldn't believe this threat, is that the threat. Is, will, if he carries it out, it will harm you. It will push you from down three to one if you're the red player. But it's also going to hurt him. Will someone who threatens something do something that will actually hurt themselves? No. 
You don't expect it. Okay? So we say it's not a credible threat. And so this idea is that it, we call it a threat game because there's a potential for a threat to change the game in, in favor, of, in this case, in the favor of the blue player, but it's not a threat game. Now, in the, uh, some of the handouts in the web, I've, I've copied a couple of pages out of a text for managers by uh, uh, David Kreps, and here's a picture of his game. Tree. Don't copy it down. You can get it on the web later or look at it, the PDF. Kreps' game tree is a little different than ours because his player A moves second, but he actually has player A's payoffs first. Okay, and you think, oh, this is weird. It's also black and white, so you don't know who's doing what. So what I did is I, I turned it around to make it look like what we want, which is a, a payoff structure like this. So Krebs looks at things more generally, and he said, look, you've got two players. They're interacting with one another. And it's basically the, the red player can challenge or not challenge the blue player. And if the, if the blue player gets challenged, they can fight or they can acquiesce. Okay? It's like the bully games kind of in high school and stuff like that. You know? And you're, thing, you're sitting there thinking, uh, the blue player gets to make their, their choice after seeing the challenge of the red guy. And if they do that, they'd rather give in. You know, I don't want to fight. It's two. Okay, there's my payoff of one. If I fight, I'm getting minus one. Okay? If they both fight, it's hurting them both. Okay? So what happens here is that red player plays challenge. The blue player acquiesces, and they get one and one. The red player thinks, well, if I don't challenge, I only get zero. I might as well challenge this guy. Okay? Because he's going to back off. And it's the same pattern of conflict of interest that we've got up above. As a matter of fact, if you subtract two from all of the payoffs here, and you reduce this branch to what we expect to happen to get the two and a four, so we eliminate this one over here, just forget about it, then these games are identical games. Now that's another uh, art that comes with game theory, is realizing, hey, this game's got exactly the same structure as that game. The payoffs are a little different. The players are a little different. You know, they, they call the labels are very different, but the structure is just the same. Okay? So um, you want to get some practice doing that. So there's, two, there's a couple of pages in the beginning of Krebs. We, we don't have to go through the, you don't have to go through the whole article. It's, it's a, a, a superb chapter on reputations. Okay? But, uh, and it has some nice examples um, with uh, Intel and uh, um, Kodak, uh, about whether threats will ever be carried through. And then there's also an idea of trust, but we'll look at that at the beginning of the next class.